So how much do you pay a month for rent? So we have, uh, me and myself and my roommate, we have a two bedroom, four bathroom apartment with a private rooftop terrace Hold up. in the <laughs> best part of Mexico City. And she got a COVID discount because she, she, she rented this place, Melissa's place, pre uh, when COVID was just kicking up and they weren't quite sure what was gonna happen. But 1350 a month is roughly what it is for two, two of us. Dollars. Dollars. Girl, hold up. Two bedrooms, mm -hmm. four bathrooms. Four ba Why are there four bathrooms? We have floors, and you don't <laughs> want to like go to another floor to use the bathroom. <laughs> you got multiple floors. Yeah, it's it's three floors. Uh, yeah. Three floors and a rooftop. Yes, it's a good, good, good situation. Damn. Um, Welcome great. to Black to Africa. I'm Tajay Moynier, your host, the California native, living her best life in Nairobi, <laughs> Kenya. I am so excited today for my guest. Listen, okay, normally we talk about being inspired, empowered, and entertained to Blacks into Africa, but we got something different for you today. This is Ree Cook, and I met her on one of my tours. I do fashion tours, eclectic fashion tours in Nairobi, Kenya. And she, oh, thank you. <laughs> and she booked the tour, and that's how we met. But she has not blacksited to Africa. She has blacksited to Mexico. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. So I hope you're prepared, you're ready to buckle up and learn about what it's like to live in Mexico and to be a slow traveler. Now, Re, please tell the people about yourself. Okay, so hey everybody, I'm Bree Cook. I'm originally from like Northeast Ohio, grew up in like outside, like rural part of, outside of Cleveland, lived most of my adult life um, after getting out of my parents' house in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And then in 2018, decided that I wanted to move abroad. And so I started becoming, living that nomad life. Um, and this is pre-pandemic, so I had to work really hard to convince my company that I could work remotely um, and was actually not able to do so. So I went and found another job that would let me work remotely. I know that's right. <laughs> marketing and advertising it was advertising an advertising agency and that tends to be a little bit old school um so i transitioned into startups started working for startups and they don't care where you are because i don't have the money to get an office anyway so um i've been living abroad since 2018 and spending like two and a half years moving every probably four to six weeks to different country uh europe Africa, Asia, Latin America, um, and when the pandemic hit, I was in Colombia, and I needed a place to be, and needed a place that I could feel safe and just settle down for a second. Um, so I moved back to Mexico City and just like <laughs> kept for the first year being like, I'll leave in six weeks, I'll live leave in eight weeks, um, and I still live there. I now consider myself uh, somebody who lives in Mexico City. Uh, while still traveling four to five months out of the year. And that's what brought me here to East Africa. I love that. So unlike most of the people that I interview, I don't really know we like that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I'm learning just as you're learning, okay? And I'm surprised and shocked and in that admiration of your lifestyle as everybody else is. Okay, so let me just back up because you spoke kind of fast. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. All right, so you decided in 2018 mm -hmm. that you were going to leave the U.S. Yes. And just travel around, be a digital nomad. Mm -hmm. What prompted that? I guess it was really 2017 um, and it had been building for a long time. Um, I am of mixed race descent and black and white and uh, in America that kind of means a lot of different things depending on what city you're from but um, it's just it was one of those things where things felt difficult and I I felt every every year like I was just waiting to go on vacation and <laughs> <laughs> that's all it was I was just waiting to go on vacation and 
you know, you really get into that mindset. My mom, um, our financial planning when we were, when I was younger was my mom was like, I just want enough money to go on vacation. And for us, that was enough gas money to drive to our relatives in St. Louis or Florida. Um, and so we lived for vacation. That's kind of how my adult life developed, but I started going other places internationally. Um, me and my mom graduated college at the same time. And so we went on a trip to Thailand. It was very cool. Um, and so that was, we just started doing these amazing vacations and, and leaving and doing two to three weeks. And I would stockpile every day I had just to like live for that flight, you know? Um, and kind of been through some work with some therapy, kind of dealing with a lot of anxiety I had. Um, and a lot of like, like kind of that manifested as panic disorder. My therapist kind of made me realize she's like do you think it's vacation or do you think you just like become a different person when you go other places or you feel a different kind of way um and i sat with that for a while and what i realized it wasn't about me not working it was about me getting somewhere else where i didn't feel the same way i felt in the united states um and that's sometimes hard to communicate what that's like and what it feels like. But when you go somewhere else and um, the there's just, for me, it just feels like there's a burden lifted. And when I go back to the United States to visit friends and family, and you know, it is a country I love, there's anxiety that kicks up again. Like, you know, I was um, sitting in a cafe in Europe and realized like, I don't sit with my, back to the wall facing the door in Europe because I don't have to work. I don't worry in the same way. I worry sometimes at home. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know. I think like in terms of like physical appearance and racial identity, um, going someplace like Asia, I feel like I look as different in Asia as I do in my hometown that I grew up in. Like more people, like it's the same amount of people that look like me in Thailand or in Chile or in <clears throat> like Croatia as look like me in the hometown that I grew up in. So it kind of, I felt at home amongst the world and just kind of followed that. You said so much, <laughs> like, no, you did. You said so much. I mean, you talked about phenotype, which mm -hmm. is something yeah. that I also covered with a friend of mine that I interviewed last week. Um, and she has a Japanese grandparent who has really strong genes. <laughs> Here she is, you know, two generations later, and she still carries that, uh, a bit of that phenotype with her. Mm -hmm. And we talked about perception and yes. how people perceive you. Yeah. And our species receives 80% of its information visually. Yep. Yeah. So it makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's for our survival. It's uh, you know it's helped us evolve mm -hmm. over millennia. It makes sense that we are very judgmental based on appearance, but how that impacts you, right? When you're like, I'm just a human. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm just a human walking around, and I haven't spent much time in Ohio, but the Midwest is very black and or white. Yeah, there's not a whole lot of other. It's growing, there. it's changing. Okay. It's actually really interesting to see when I go home now because when I grew up, like our, like our hometown was the most diverse hometown um, of 8,000 people in our county. Um, okay. <laughs> that, meant, that meant we had black people and we had white people. We had one Hindi family and we had one Laotian family. Okay. Um, so that's the diversity you what? get. What? Yeah, but yours was the, that was the most diverse in your county? Yeah. Oh yeah, oh everybody God. else is just is white. Um, okay. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Everybody I know from Ohio is black. But because they <laughs> we tend to black. leave. <laughs> we tend to leave. Okay. Um, but yeah, no, and I mean, I'm from a really rural part of of Ohio, which is different than Cleveland, different than Columbus, Cincinnati. Yeah. yeah. Which do have great thriving black cultures, but I'm just not from a part of the state that that had that. Um, and so yeah, but mixed race people and people who are lighter skinned are were not that common when I was growing up yeah um yeah my mom was the only person that she knew that she was raising a mixed child and so I was neither necessarily black in the sense of like I was not black 
because people were black where I was from or they were white. And so kind of like living in between in the middle um, was definitely somewhat uncomfortable as a child, but also really prepared me to live amongst the world. Like mm -hmm. I remember when me and my mom, we went to Thailand and it was the first time we'd ever been someplace like that. And there was just something that I noticed with her because she was the first time she had been somewhere where everybody didn't look like her. Mm. And that's where I lived. I'd never been a place until I went to Morocco. <laughs> I'd never been a place where I could like blend in, where I could look like everybody yeah, else. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so even like, you know, I go to my family reunions, I don't look like, well now, there's a lot more mixed people in my family. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, it was really interesting to be amongst, be around somebody and see them experiencing the world the way that I the way that it. you do. Yeah. Your mom's white American? She's white, yeah. Okay. American. 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 Yeah. yeah. Yeah, for sure. And your dad <laughs> is black American? Mm -hmm. Now, growing up, where you did in rural America as you call yourself mixed race. That's how you self-identify? I, I self-identify as black. Okay. Yeah. So um, it's okay. Can I say biracial? Can I say mixed race? Yeah, which is, that's, which is okay. and that's also fine too. Okay, okay. cool. Yeah. Um, you spoke about anxiety mm -hmm. and you spoke about being in Europe and not sitting with your back up against the wall, yeah. which is how I was taught to say yeah. it, right? Yeah. Um, what was it that prompted the anxiety? Mm -hmm. I think it's 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 a number of things. I think really I come from a family that doesn't necessarily celebrate or like give you space to like express your feelings and your emotions. Um, and so, you know, I can see that now as an adult who's done some emotional work, you know, you go into my family unit and what is kind of normalized is, is really not talking about things. Um, especially on my dad's side of the family, we're very much like put it in God's hands and like <laughs> walk away from it. Which... Give it to Jesus. Give it to Jesus. <laughs> God's got a plan. I'll pray on it. And then I'm like, but no, wait, can I talk to you about how we could fix this problem? <laughs> you know, like maybe God wants us to get up and do something about it, is what I talk to my grandma about all the time. Um, but so I think like kind of living in that space where you're not, it never felt like acceptable or celebrated for me to talk about what I was feeling. And I felt so much as a child. So like, I feel like I just like put a kibosh on it. And like my like co coping mechanism was to kind of cut all of that off and eventually it builds up. And eventually, I mean, I was having panic attacks all the time when I was in my 20, early 20s. And I knew I had to change something. And I knew that looking at the people around me, they didn't have the answers. And I had to go get them for myself. And the only time I felt good, the only time I felt like like thriving and like where I was, when I, I was in the place that I was supposed to be was when I arrived somewhere and I was walking around and I was experiencing new things and looking at other ways that people lived their lives. Wow. Yeah. So were you able to answer your therapist's question? Is it traveling or is it that you're a new person when you travel? I think at first, uh, traveling was a coping mechanism for something I was kind of running from. And it was kind of self-medicating in a way, mm -hmm. in a way that was wildly socially acceptable. Not mm -hmm. all the ways that we self-medicate are socially yeah. acceptable, but traveling was <clears throat> a way for me to really feel pulled into the present moment aware of my surroundings, feel bliss, yes. feel bl gratitude, yes. just like be in that moment. And after a couple years of doing it, I realized I didn't want to be a person who used travel and used other cultures in order to like self-medicate. So continuing some work on figuring out, okay, like even if I'm not experiencing something new, even if I'm not traveling the pandemic was a great example how do i still feel alive and present and in that moment um and that travel showed me it was possible travel showed me what bliss could be and then i felt like i had to do a lot of work to figure out how to get there on my own without using it in that way and so since then my relationship with travel has really changed it's less mm. transactional and it's mm. less about like 
I arrive in a place and I expect it to make me feel better. Wow. You know, it's, you arrive at a place and you allow a place to be what it is. Yes. Yeah. And that's not how I used to approach it. <laughs> Takes time though. Girl, talk your shit. I love this. <laughs> no, I love it because so many people say that they love traveling. They want to travel more. And you ask people, like, what's your mm -hmm. hobby? What do you love? It's travel. And I've been saying, I think the reason why we all love to travel, I shouldn't say all, but most people love to travel, mm -hmm. is because it allows you to be present. Yes. Everything is so new yeah. and so fresh and intriguing. And you may even be harmed if you're not present, yeah. right? If you look left, yeah. you should be looking right when you yeah. cross the street. You, you know, you don't count those Kenyan <laughs> shillings right. You end up giving somebody a stupid tip. <laughs> yes, yeah. no. And then in my spiritual work, you know, I know that um, anxiety, mm -hmm. right, is is thinking about the future. Yeah. And depression is being stuck in the past. Yeah. But present, right, at Cartoli, the power of now mm -hmm. is like being right, right here in are. the present. Yeah. I love that. Okay, so you didn't just decide to like, I'm just going to move to Japan. You decided you were going to be a digital nomad. Yeah. You were very intentional about mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Um, as opposed to a slow traveler, because I'm a slow traveler. Yeah. And at first I was like, oh, I'm a nomad. But then I realized, no, I really like being in a place for a specific amount of time mm -hmm. and absorbing what I can from the culture, giving what I can. And then when I'm tired of being there, I want to just, you know, say goodbye to everybody and move on mm -hmm. with all these new experiences. Yeah. So now you are a slow traveler. Now you're a slow traveler. Mm -hmm. Before you were a digital nomad. Yeah. Now... What I'm not into the quantity, but just tell us like where are all the places you've been? Um, so you know when I when I kind of first started, I was in Europe and did about six to eight countries within Europe for like four weeks each. Um, spent a month in Marrakesh and then moved on in Hanoi. I love Vietnam. Mm -hmm. um, I love Thailand. Just really great. I did spend uh, a month in like Kyoto and like Japan, and that was really really cool. Uh, Malaysia, Singapore, Santiago, Lima, a lot of time in Medellin, a lot of time in Colombia, <laughs> like months in Colombia, it's so great. Um, Ecuador, um, and then a lot of time in Mexico too, yeah. So Ooh. that's kind of like the path that I had like traveled on and then started going back to places that I really, really love. When I told that I was going to leave, a lot of people in my community had told me like, I wonder how long you'll do it before you get it out of your system. <laughs> right. Um, before, like, when do you think you're going to settle down? It's like two years in, when do you think you're going to settle down? Um, and that meant, that means a lot of things for, for me and my community. Um, and then I kind of was living like that. I was living kind of like there was an expiration date or a clock running out. Mm. And like somebody would make me come back to live <laughs> in the United States or I wouldn't be able to do it. And then once I realized that it was a completely, if I went slower, it was a completely sustainable way of life that um, I paid off all the debt that I had in the first year. I was able to actually build up a savings. What? Uh-huh. And now I'm like, like within the next 10 years, like we'll have the option of whether or not I want to continue to work because I keep my cost of living low. And I just realized it was way more sustainable for me to be gone than it was for me to come back. Like, wow. the easier choice was not going home. The easier choice was staying out abroad. So I love that. Yeah. The biggest thing I think that's keeping people from taking that leap is fear of the unknown, mm -hmm. but also finances. Yeah. So people always want to know, like, how are you affording to do it? What type of job? You know yeah. what I mean? Can you give us some background, if you're comfortable, mm -hmm. like what you do, um, the range of your earnings, yeah. what your uh, living expenses are in Mexico City mm -hmm. versus traveling? Yeah. So I, when I first went abroad in the first year, I spent probably 
like $36,000 on uh, travel, like flight flights, like workspaces, food, beverage experiences, all of that. Um, and accommodations? And accommodations as well. Oh, and this yeah. was in Europe. This is Europe, Africa, Asia. So it was 12 different countries. Um, Europe, Africa, Asia, South America. Um, and so, yeah, it was, and I was not trying to hold back on anything. It was just like, things just didn't cost as much. Now, some months cost more, like Japan's really expensive, but you just kind of like move and shake. And I did the, I did the analysis at the end of the first year and I was like, I spent the same amount as I did like when I lived in Pittsburgh. Um, Damn. which, you know, and like, it, it was, it was really eye opening to me yeah, because I yeah. just assumed that I was doing something and I was like kind of paying a bill that I or like putting money on a credit card that I'd have to pay off later. Yeah. But it wasn't that it was a very much lived within my means. I had a way higher quality of life. Um, and then I started like changing the way that I traveled. And when you don't get on a plane every four weeks, that's even cheaper. Um, and that's what really brought me to slow travel because slow travel is a very economic way mm -hmm. of like traveling. You get like longer discounts on accommodations if you stay, you know, True. a month or more. Right. Also, it's less flights. Um, and as I've like gotten older, I've been more like sensitive to how many flights I'm taking in general, just like the economic and well, the environmental cost of doing that. Right. Um, and it's just, it's more in alignment with like my values in terms of wanting, like you'd said, wanting to actually experience a culture, um, actually kind of like ingratiate yourself a little bit yeah. into like other people's way of life as opposed to running through, hitting the tourist spots, getting yeah. a shot so that somebody says like, did you go to Prague? Did you see this? And you can say yes. That's yeah. like not the type of travel you do anymore. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And when you live, and when you really start kind of living that way, it becomes really wildly affordable because pretty much everywhere is cheaper um, than the United States and you can find ways to, to make it work for you for sure. Especially if you making that USD, yeah. okay? So, so that's really a challenge, yeah. you know, for people mm -hmm. who are not coming with a job in hand. Yeah. You know, so you said you do marketing mm -hmm. and she works for a company. It's a startup that provides telemedical care mm -hmm. for people of color in the U.S. Mm -hmm. I love it. Like, I love the mission yeah. Um, for those of you who don't know the disparities in terms of treatment and medical care, access to medical care, there's a huge disparity sure. between white folks and people of color in particular, black folks and, and white folks. And yeah. indigenous. And indigenous, well. yeah. yes. Yeah. And indigenous. She gonna, look, she gonna, and it's also... It's also more so geared for people in rural areas, is that correct? Yeah, it's really set up well to deal, to give medical care and more frequent, like higher quality medical care to people that have lack of access for a number of reasons. So that's what our company does. It's called Spore Health and we're focused on training providers to be able to meet cultural needs. Um, and it's just not about race or ethnicity and it's not about creating stereotypes. It's about looking at somebody and like, how well equipped is your primary care provider to look at you and understand the way in which language, um, ancestry, like social determinants of health, gender, fat phobia, ableism, all of those things like really come into play and affect our, the medical care that we receive. And so our company is out to change that for primary care and maternal care specifically. And um, yeah, it's also a great company that allows me to work from wherever I want. Okay, so I want to talk about Mexico. So you said what happened, you were, it was pandemic, you were in Colombia. Mm -hmm. And at what point did you decide, oh, I'm gonna go to Mexico City? So, I mean, when I was in Colombia, uh, I was there for the first eight months of the pandemic and Colombia was real, it was a real scary place to be in terms of uh, the way in which they approached the pandemic was the <laughs> opposite of the way that the U.S. kind of approached it. So I was living in a rural part of Colombia, I was on a coffee farm um, and yeah, they, like you weren't allowed to leave the house, you weren't allowed to go anywhere in order to 
get to Medellin where I could fly out of to get back to, the only place you could go was the US. Like you, the only place, place planes were flying was the country that you have a passport. So I went to the US um, and of course landed in Fort Lauderdale and they're like, what pandemic? <laughs> And I was so culture shook. And then I like landed back in like Ohio. My mom's like, do you want to go to the Hobby Lobby tomorrow? It's open. And I was like, why is the Hobby Lobby open? This is crazy. So Hobby um, Lobby is a craft store. Yeah, <laughs> right. It's a very, it's a very Christian craft store. It was considered an essential business in the height of the pandemic in Ohio. So like, it just was weird to me uh, going from being completely locked down to another extreme of like not at all really being locked down and people not taking masks seriously and people not taking the pandemic seriously. Um, so I, but I wanted to be with my family. So I spent some time back home and really realized uh, quickly that like, no, I still can't do this. And mm -hmm. um, it's just not good for my mental health in a no number of ways. And also, I just didn't really feel like I was doing much in the United States. It's kind of, for me, it's not a place that I'm like putting down roots. It's not a place that I'm like investing my time in because I know I don't want to be there long term. So I had a friend who, I have several friends in Mexico City, but I had a friend who had just got an apartment. She had an extra bedroom. She's like, I'm down for a couple of weeks. Like, stay with me. Did I meet that friend? That's yeah, Carol. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Carol also came yeah. on the tour. Mm -hmm. Can I rewind just mm -hmm. a bit? Um, you don't have to tell us all your business, but I think people who've never been to the U.S. are really curious mm -hmm. about why we leave mm -hmm. because they want to go. Yeah. When you say being back in Ohio was not good for your mental health, why is that? Um... <laughs> It's complicated, and okay. I think it's really, really hard for people to, un unless you like live through it. I just like haven't really met too many people who I've been able to communicate it with too easily. So, mm. but I will do my best here. I think for me, what it is is that I don't feel like creatively inspired, and I don't feel drive in the United States in the way that I do in other places. Mm -hmm. What I feel is pressure to be productive. Right. Pressure to be on the move, running errands, doing things, seeing people, having drinks there, doing this, doing that. But I don't actually feel like an intrinsic, like, I wanna go create something. Like, I, yeah. I, like, I feel inspired by that and I wanna go do it. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of my time in the United States is characterized by me having to get into a car and drive somewhere where I spend money. Um, and like, yeah. that's lame to me. That doesn't make me happy. That doesn't fill my cup. And there are obviously some parts of the United States where that's maybe not the case, but for the most part, it kind of is. We get in cars and we drive places and we spend money. And my experience living in different countries is that I don't have to do either of those things when I leave the house. I can go for a walk, um, I can watch people performing in the street, I can go to free museums, I can, um, you know, just really kind of be out amongst and not feel like I'm consuming. Um, and that means, like for me, that feels like I can create. If I'm not a consumer, I'm a creator. Um, and that's what I really, I think, kind of a, a deeper level of what I don't love about the United States and what I feel a little bit more at liberty to do elsewhere. That's so deep. <laughs> it's really yeah. deep because the U.S. does prioritize doing mm -hmm. over being. Yeah. Of all classes. Yes. Yeah. However, when you travel, if you if you are of a certain means, mm -hmm. you do have the luxury of being. The fact that you're tapped into that though, the fact that you're sensitive enough to that to know like, oh, I'm just out here consuming. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm making the money, I, you know, I'm surrounded by my tribe, but I'm just out here consuming. Yeah. And that just doesn't feel right to me. The fact that you're perceptive to that, I think speaks volumes about who you are as a person. Mm -hmm. it I think also living in Latin America and experiencing Latin America is it's a culture that compared to other cultures, uh, like non-European cultures, probably close, most closely kind of mirrors our own in a way in terms of we're North Americans, especially in Mexico. Um, 
And when you go to Latin America, pretty much every city in Latin America has like a like a central square mm. where there's benches and people are allowed to just sit down and mm -hmm. people sit there for free. They're not expected to buy a coffee. You don't have to move every once in a while. And I remember living in Pittsburgh for so long. Um, Pittsburgh is like a lovely city. It's one of my favorite American cities. Um, but the downtown is really concentrated at like this point that we have where two rivers run. And people live on certain sides of the bridges, but everybody kind of connects through downtown. And especially people who take public transportation, that is people of color in Pittsburgh. And sometimes it'll be like an hour or two before your next Bucks bus connection comes by. So there's mm. a lot of people that just don't have anywhere to sit and don't have anywhere to be while they're waiting for their bus. Mm -hmm. And the police will come through and they'll ask them to move and you can't sit there too in long. In the park? In the park. And if you think about it, it's actually very common in the United States that there are very few places where people are allowed to just sit and be without having an economic reason to be there. Damn. So you get that in other places and it just, you know, that's just like one example of a way that I think like, I just feel more at ease in other parts of the world. Like I'm able to just sit on a bench and nobody's going to bother me. Like nobody's going to ask me to move. I don't have to have a reason for being there. Right. I don't have to be reading a book. I don't have to be meeting a friend. I don't have to be on my way somewhere else. Like it's expected that you're there because you're there, not because of some other reason, which is what we... We ask people when they sit on benches in the United States. Right. What are you doing? What are you doing? Nothing is the answer. <laughs> that's not a good answer in the United States. I haven't really had that experience, mm -hmm. but I'm not discounting your experience. I know that what you're saying to me is true. And mm -hmm. wow, I never thought of it that way. But I thought you were going to bring up siestas. Being in Latin America, <laughs> like siestas, I lived in Mallorca, uh, Mallorca, Spain for mm. a little while. And these uh, two to four hour siestas that everybody gets, even the construction workers. Yeah. That also promotes just being and also community as well. And there's just a difference in the perception of what's necessary. So there, think of like a lot of people are informally employed in Mexico. So they have taquerias, they have little shops where they print stuff and sell loose cigarettes, like they're hustlers. But a lot of people have a number in mind in terms of how much they need to make that day. And once they make it, they shut up shop. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter if it's 2 p.m., doesn't matter if it's 8 a.m., doesn't matter if it's 7 p.m. Like you have a number in your mind and like, you're like, good, I worked for the day because I made enough money, I sold enough tacos. Like, I'm going home and like, I'm going to enjoy my life. And that blew my mind. It's like, I'm sorry, you can just leave? <laughs> you can just leave. So there's a lot of things you encounter there where you'll like go to a store to like, that has set hours and they're like, yeah, we just like left. Like, we just Yo. stopped. So instead of like stopping in the middle of the day, they just stop whenever they want to. <laughs> I did experience that in Spain as well, in Mallorca. Mm. I'm like, but we're right here. Yeah. No, I'm about to go and have lunch with my grandson mm -hmm. and I'll be back in an hour. Mm -hmm. And if you want this service, you'll come back. If you don't, <laughs> you don't. I was just like, yeah. huh? Well, and, and I mean, there are black people in Mexico. Um, there are black Mexicans that have been there for generations. But do they self-identify though? Uh, it's different. Yeah, they it's don't. It's different, but they are descendants of slaves. There were slaves in Mexico. If you go to the state of Veracruz, there's black people there that are descendants right. of slaves and they're Mexican, but they're from Veracruz mm -hmm. and they're black and um, they identify in a different kind of way from us, but um, it's really interesting to see that there is that cult, that already existing culture that exists differently than the African-American culture. Mm -hmm. But also, I know so many black people who have moved to Mexico mm -hmm. and so many black people who come to Mexico and are staying for longer and longer periods of time and not just Mexico City, but all over. Um, there's a large community of people in Playa del Carmen, San Miguel de Allende, um, Veracruz and um, Guanajuato and like all of these places where people come and are building these communities and they've been doing it for a long time. I know a friend of mine, he moved uh, to Mexico in the 80s and like never looked back. 
That's so, right. <laughs> I know that's right. So now I want to talk about <laughs> what I really want to talk about. Let's go ahead. <laughs> why mango? Yeah, that's a great question. And honestly, I probably have more answers than like, I just have a lot of answers for that. Um, I think baseline, like the, the high level is that like it's really convenient in terms of time zones. Central time is like the best time to work on. I work between two teams on Pacific time and East Coast time. Um, the affordability of Mexico is, is really, really great. You can live a really high quality life um, for, I, we don't say cheap, it's not cheap. If you live in Mexico and you're from Mexico and you live, make a Mexican salary, it's not cheap to live in Mexico City but um, it is affordable. You can find pockets of it that like match pretty much any budget. Um, and there's a thriving culture there. I feel like that's something I've been missing mm -hmm. in um, kind of my previous versions of life back in the United States. It just feels like there's constantly something that um, is teaching me something about where we all come from as humans. Um, one of my favorite things in Mexico is the Anthropology Museum, which I just didn't think that that would be something I would be really into. Um, but they have this beautiful history of like humankind there um, and like all different levels of it. And I feel like that's something that comes through a lot. Um, but honestly, the top reason for me is food and beverage. <laughs> I just want to eat and drink and <laughs> oh my god there's no better place to do it if you love food you will love mexico point blank oh Period. i was on the gram <laughs> and i saw that travel and leisure had did like a short feature mm -hmm. on street food oh in mexico city yep and I wrote in the comments, I was like, no, now I got it. I have to go. Food's yeah. the first thing that people bring. And food's the first thing that's accepted from a new, like, group of immigrants. Like, like you know, keep your other stuff. But, like, yeah, what are your spices, though? You yeah, know? yeah. Um, and, like, Mexico has been very open to immigration at all stages of its history. Um so especially like post like colonization, they had, I mean, it was kind of the midpoint between Spain and, and East Asia. So like the other colony that Spain had was, was the Philippines. Mm -hmm. So there's a Filipino culture mm -hmm. in Mexico. Like a lot of Mexican food is influenced by Filipino culture. And um, the most famous taco in uh, Mexico is the Taco El Pastor, mm -hmm. which basically looks like a falafel. <laughs> it's like it's cut off of like the large piece of meat that's roasted like vertically. Okay. And that's because um, during the, um, the Ottoman Wars, like in the early 1900s, they had a huge Lebanese population move in and they're trying to sell their they're, they're like falafels and Mexicans are like, no. And they're like, well, what if we put it on a corn tortilla with some onions and a little pineapple slice? And people are like, this is not Mexican. Like this is a, Me it's a Mexican thing now, but it's influenced by so many different things. And then the rich culture, uh, cultures of like indigenous populations in Mexico is wild and insane. And there are a lot of places you go in Mexico and nobody speaks Spanish. Like that still exists. Um, and there's just, for me, I think it's, people are so proud to be Mexican. And like you said, there was like a large conception. I think if you come from the United States, we're told that we're really lucky to be there and that people die to get there. And all of that has been true and still is true to this day that people still are dying to get there. But, um, there are also <laughs> many many places in the world where that's not true and where i think mexico is one of those places where um you can go and you can be and you can exist and you can get great food you can meet people from all over the world and you can also have your own culture celebrated um i found people in mexico to be very curious about what other people are up to they love black people there i mean not every person you're gonna meet is gonna love black people but I, we were at a large black brunch and like people love it. People love the energy. Like it just, it's much more in line than like the traditional gringos that kind of come and are quiet. <laughs> like sit at their table and don't sing. Like, you know? Yo, I just, <laughs> we're so, I will say black Americans, Mexicans, 
and Filipinos. We have a lot more in common. We get along so oh, well. Wow. Yeah, we have a lot, <laughs> there's a lot in common, like culturally, like like I go and I'll, I'll be at a family gathering of some like Mexican friends and like seeing how their families interact. That reminds me of like how my family interacts at a family reunion. For sure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's like somebody invites you over. I mean, my experience um, with Mexican Americans, like somebody invites you over for lunch yeah. or, you know, next thing you know, we're playing cards. Next thing you know, we're moving the table out the way so folks can dance. <laughs> I have never had a one-on-one -on -one lunch or meal or drink with one of my Mexican friends because you, you plan it to be that way and you're like, hey, let's meet for a drink. They bring five people because you don't ever, like if we're going somewhere, we're all going to go and it's going to be a group and you're going to meet people and um, that's something I like really respond to and I think just makes it warm and inviting. But I will also say that Mexico is a place that like you can just relax as well. Um, and you can really kind of be onto yourself without much, like many people bothering you or anything. Like if you get the best of both worlds, I think when you want to be part of something and part of a community and involved in talking to people, you can find that. But if you just want to, you know, read by yourself on a park bench, which is like my favorite thing to do, you can do that as well. So growing up, they told me that Mexico was impoverished and violent, very dangerous. That has not been the case for you. It's definitely not the case for me. Um, living in Mexico City, there are different parts. It's it's a it's a huge city. Um, takes about an hour to even just drive to the city limits from like wow. the center. Uh, it's 22 million people. So it's bigger than New York and all the boroughs. <laughs> like there's more people. So there are a massive number of people who live massively different lives depending on what part of the, the area you are in. Um, in terms of safety, as a foreigner, as an expat, I it, it has been, I feel at ease. I feel safe. Um, I don't feel like, I don't feel the way that sometimes I would feel and like level of discomfort um, being on my own in public at any time of day or night. Um, and that's how I feel in most of Mexico as well. There are parts that um, are more dangerous just because Mexico is on the route of like the drug route essentially coming from where, you know, uh, South America. But it's violent because we buy drugs in the United States. Right. Not because Mexicans are violent, but they happen to be along the drug mm -hmm. routes. So along the trade routes. So, and we are the biggest yeah. customers. <laughs> well, and like if you I have a great example too. Like I know a lot of people are like discovering Tulum and love Tulum. Um, and Tulum's got a really, really dark part, dark side of it, where there's lots of violence now, lots of shootings and um, that all of that's going up because more American tourists are coming there and they want to do coke, they want to do molly, they want to get drugs, and that with it brings violence and harms the place. So um, I love travel. I think we should all travel, but I think we have to think about how to do it ethically um, in, in drug use in other countries. Well, drug use anywhere. I think we need to question the ethics of it, specifically um, cocaine. Uh, put that, I'll just put that out there that like the reputation that Mexico has, um, I think largely we're to blame. And there you have it. You've talked about the pros of living in Mexico, but I'd like to know about the cons for anyone who's literally considering moving because so many of us see the Instagram yeah. reels where people partying it up in Tulum, in Tulum right? Yep. And Pai del Carmen, yeah. et cetera. Mm -hmm. So what's the real? Like, what are the things that you're like, ah, oh, I could do without it? There, I mean, yes. And I'm really glad you're asking this question too because a lot of people don't start to ask this question until after the fact. And I know a lot of people who have only heard the positive sides of it and then they move somewhere and then they feel like something's wrong with them. <laughs> okay. And it's like, not, not, like... The thing with, with living in Mexico, we say, like, um, it's Mexico, kind of like, this is Africa, right? Like, the, you know, like, <laughs> you just got to let go and let God sometimes. Like, mm -hmm. you can't go out and run four errands in a day. What you, you have to have smaller goals for your productivity because mm. 
you got to ship something, you got to get something tailored, you got to drop off laundry. Like you're only going to get one of those things done just because there will be barriers to stop you in terms of who's open at the time, what's what roads are closed because of, you know, it's a national holiday. They have a lot of national holidays that we're not prepared for. Um, and so I just think that the thing about the United States is that it's so convenient. And the convenience, in my opinion, kills us. Like we expect everything to be so easy. And so um, the smallest hard thing feels like a massive mountain just because, you know, when you go to Target and like you have to park in the back of the parking lot and then return your card at the front. Like that was a hard day for me back in the United States. Because things are so convenient. <laughs> I don't know. We just get on we my nerves. We do have the drive, the drive through pickup. <laughs> Everything yeah, we is do. very convenient, and you expect like websites to work. You expect people to pick, answer the phone when they pick up, and people do. They do not in Mexico, and they do not in a lot of other places. Okay, so we talked about convenience. Mm -hmm. What would be another con? Um, I think it's very easy, and this isn't probably just Mexico, but it's it's. Uh, it's hard sometimes to like feel at home in a place and like when you move to a new place like in a culture that's not your own and you're looking to make that place home um, it's a it's a long process to like feel like you're mm. meeting people and developing relationships with people that are also from there so expat communities are really really great and they're super wonderful for making friends and most of my friends in Mexico City are expats um, the harder struggle has been to meet Mexicans and people from Mexico City <laughs> um, and really kind of get to know people in an authentic way um, because that's just, it's a little bit harder in terms of you've got differences in culture. Um, you might be moving to a place where you don't know the language and I highly recommend you learn the language at the place that you're going to be if you're anticipating living there um, because that's where most of you know, being in a room full of like, you know, people from Mexico City, people mostly speak English and like to have to force them to speak in English while you're there to accommodate you is something that's really uncomfortable to sit with sometimes for me. So that's why like learning Spanish had been was really important for me so that I could understand and follow people that I was trying to get to know and allow them to express themselves in their native tongue. That's true. So you're saying that most people speak Spanish. And so when you're the only non-Spanish speaker in the room, it can be uncomfortable. Yeah. I feel that. I feel the same way actually here. Yeah, I'm um, sure. I pick up certain words in Swahili, but most of the time I can't put, I can't string together the context of the whole yeah. sentence, you know? Um, fortunately here in Kenya, people speak a combination of English mm -hmm. and Swahili, mm -hmm. or I'll say in Nairobi specifically. So you were saying that most of your friends are from the expat community. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How did you find these people? And, you know, what do y'all do? Like, professionally, what do y'all do when you typically get together? Yeah, so... The, I mean, especially in a city like Mexico City, there's just so many people. I think the bigger struggle has been finding people who are committed to being in Mexico City the same way I'm committed to being in Mexico City. You can always find people and they're there for a month, they're there for, you know, a couple of weeks. And that's great and it's wonderful and you do meet a lot of people that way. But um, when you live in a place and you're like here, like you're here in Kenya and you meet people like, um, I'm looking to invest in relationships with people who will be around for my birthday next year and like I can plan a trip to Mexican wine country with you in a couple of months or something like that. So finding people who are more committed to kind of being in that stage um, can be kind of like another layer but honestly it's it hasn't been difficult. There's like really great Facebook groups, there's WhatsApp groups. If you meet one expat and it'll drop, drop you into like, there's two big uh, WhatsApp groups for like black expats in Mexico City. And there's always things that people have going on. Um, like a great example is there's like uh, kind of like a, a African market that's done once a month. And mm. they cook like African food and it's like, 
a lot of like um, people from Mexico that are like of the African diaspora, but also like uh, there's a lot of like uh, Haitian, Jamaican, um, other kinds of different people and different black people specifically that are building community and making sure that you're kind of like tapped into that. Um, and then it's really easy once you figure out what you'd like to do to find groups that are doing those things. So something that I do with, um, in a way that I've met a lot of expats that are like there more permanently, um, is we started playing this board game called Cash Flow. It's from Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Okay. Um, and it's about kind of like wealth building in yeah. a different type of way. And it really helps you. It's like Monopoly on steroids, but it helps you like confront some of your like mindsets about mm. money and financial independence and all of that. And so we found a group of people who are really interested in playing that game and we host it once a month at my house. And it's fun you get to meet new people there's always new people and it's always like a really good mix of like expats but also we have a lot of like latinos and people from latin america that come and play too um and it's a really fun time um and that has been a really nice way to like meet people figure out who you want to get coffee with like oh you like this oh and like you can just start really meeting people and finding fun things to do that you're into okay yeah so how much do you pay a month for rent? So we have, uh, me and myself and my roommate, we have a two bedroom, four bathroom apartment with a private rooftop terrace how, uh, in the uh, best part of Mexico City. And she got a COVID discount because she 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 rented this place and Lisa's place pre uh, when COVID was just kicking up and they weren't quite sure what was gonna happen. But 1350 a month is roughly what it is for Two, two of us. Dollars. Dollars. Girl, hold up. Mm -hmm. Two bedrooms. Mm -hmm. Four bathrooms. Four ba Why are there four bathrooms? We have floors and you <laughs> don't want to like go to another floor to use the bathroom. They can't, you got multiple floors? Yeah, it's, it's three floors. A, yeah. Three floors and a rooftop. Yes. It's a good, good, good situation. Damn. Prices are increasing in Mexico City because it's gotten wildly popular and you have a lot of people moving from New York and LA who don't know what they should be paying and they think they're getting a good deal if they're paying $3,500 a month yes. for a studio. Idiots. Um, <laughs> but you can still find really, really, really good deals if That's you look. And, look. Yeah, yeah. That's a good look if you're coming yeah. with USD. Let's if you're, just say If you're that. coming with USD, it's really sustainable. And also, with an actual lease, we're able to, like, I've been in East Africa this whole summer and going to Europe after this. And so I'll, I'm gone six months this year um, and was able to easily find somebody to rent our place out for that at a little bit of a profit. So it's having real estate mm. in Mexico is a good deal. It's Let a really me tell good you deal. something. That's cheaper than here. Yeah. yeah. It's cheaper than Kampala. You know what yeah. I'm saying? I'm yeah. just like, if I didn't have cultural, historical ties mm -hmm. in Africa, I don't think I would be here. Yeah. I think I would be where my money would go the furthest. The furthest. Yeah. So, how many countries have you been to in Africa? This is my third African country. Kenya, Rwanda. And Morocco. and Morocco. Yeah. I've been to those as well. Yeah. Now, how does Mexico compare to Kenya? Very different. <laughs> <laughs> very, very different, but like in a in a super great way. Like I feel like really both have their own strengths and advantages. And um, the similarity I think is that people feel very warm here. Um, in the same way that people feel like warm in Mexico. Um so I think that kind of feels like a similarity, but overall, everything just feels very different. Mexico is very European in the sense that, I mean, like Spain, right? Like, so there's a lot of like European expectations for like um, architecture and city planning and, mm. and just the way that like some things work. So it feels, this feels more outside of the, the kind of like, Eurocentric comfort zone um, and like gives you so much more I think in terms of um, culture and flavor and like the way in which kind of things operate here 
So, and that's not just Nairobi, but I've spent some time on the coast as well. Um, and that was really interesting to be in a place that kind of more so reminded me of Asia than yeah. anything, anything up north or back, back east. Yeah. Yes. And how long have you been in Kenya? I've been here seven weeks. Oh my God. I know. <laughs> I thought it was just four weeks. Four weeks in Nairobi and then like four weeks or three and a half in, in on the coast in Watamu. Okay. So, yeah. I'd love to do West Africa eventually. And I think when I decided to come to East Africa this summer, many people asked me like, why didn't you go to West Africa? Because West Africa just, I mean, I know a lot of West Africans and like I'm of West African descent. Um, but there is something I just kept hearing how chill East Africa was by comparison. <laughs> and I was like, that, that more so than like the, you know, I just want to chill and it's been beautiful and it's been wonderful. And like, there's definitely a lot of like fun and it's just, there's like really cool culture here that I think is not necessarily the culture that we get to see because East African culture isn't exported in the way that West African culture is exported. So it's been beautiful to be here. So where are you traveling to next? Um, I am off to back to Europe for a couple of months. It's been a couple of years since I've been there. So I'm spending some time in Copenhagen and Germany, Switzerland and Italy. I forgot to ask you, what are your favorite countries? Ooh, God, that's a hard one. <laughs> that's a hard one. I mean, one. you said, <laughs> yeah. like, you will revisit those places that you mm -hmm. really felt. Yeah. So what are those places? Up until, up until the pandemic hit and I, you know, decided to go to Mexico, my plan before that was to move to Portugal and get the residency mm. and live in Lisbon. I love Portugal. I love Portuguese culture. It's super interesting and like, yeah. it's super interesting to me. Like how did this little land with no resources and no army, like not get conquered by Europe, Spain and France when they conquered the rest of the world. And not yeah. only that, but like, how did they, how did they take Brazil? Like, I don't know. I don't, it's just, they're very, it's very interesting culture. So I love Portugal. I saw your stories on the street art, mm. the street graffiti. Yeah. And so much of it was Portugal the on her Instagram. Y'all gotta yeah. go to her her Instagram. It's yeah. beautiful. <laughs> the the art culture in in Portugal is amazing. They've also got a really nice wine culture and um, food and food. Yeah, the food's great. Um, but other than you know that Mexico, obviously, one hundred percent. Mexico's amazing. I spent a lot of time in Colombia, and I really really love Colombia. I also encourage people that are going to Colombia to not just go to Medellin. Medellin's great, but like my favorite parts of Colombia are like not just the one city. Um, and then Hanoi, Vietnam was mm. probably hands down like the coolest travel experience I've had. Had the best food, mm. the coolest people. Um, and there's just something happening in Vietnam that like, it feels like it's on its way up. And I feel that way about Mexico too. Um, and once you get there, you just notice you're just like people are on their way up here. They're so it's doing the energy. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. What has world travel taught you? Uh, gosh, so <laughs> much. So 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 much. Um, I think you know you learn inherently a lot about yourself as a traveler. Um, I've learned what I like and what I don't like, mm -hmm. and I've like gotten a better idea of what I like to do, how I want to spend my time. You have to be so intentional when you travel about what you do, because even if you, you have a month in a place, you're still, I'm working full time. You have, you know, nights that you just need to not do anything. You need to stay home. And if you're doing like the long-term travel thing, you can't be going every day. Like, <laughs> like that's not like... Like every day is not Instagrammable, like let me tell you. So even being here in Kenya, like I had to be really intentional and do some research ahead of time. But you know, it's taught me what I like and what is not just what I like in Kenya, but what I like anywhere. So I, what you know, I like is I love coffee. 
um, and learning about coffee culture, having the best coffee. I love arboretums and botanical gardens and like taking walks and like seeing how different things are curated. <laughs> I love meeting local artists um, and learning about their process. So your designer friend and stylist, uh, Erica, who I met on Tadre's tour was an amazing person to meet because she's creating art in handbags and like the, the styling of certain things. And um, those are the things I really love. Mm -hmm. So if I don't get to see, you know, the, the, the main tourist point, like I'll sleep fine. Yeah, I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> I don't get to see the big church or you have to see this temple or you got to do this waterfall hike. That's going to be a no for me. Like maybe if I have time, but I've learned how to like prioritize what I really like. And that's that's been a real gift. The travels taught me. I feel you on that. What has Mexico taught you? Mexico has taught me how to enjoy life in a way that is really not something I think I was doing before or really had the knowledge of how to do. Um, people in Mexico and people of Mexican descent, um, the, the culture is really focused on, I think, being present and existing and enjoying what you have when you have it. Um, so if you're just like sitting and just drinking a beer, having a mezcal by yourself, or you're um, with family and like you're in kind of like that, um, there's like a level of appreciation that I think that Mexico has taught me to have for like just whatever is in front of you and like pulls you into the present. That's beautiful. <laughs> and lastly, what has Kenya taught you? Ooh, Kenya. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> I think Kenya has taught me that Africa will blow your mind. <laughs> Like the things, both Kenya and Rwanda, like East Africa in general, um, I didn't have a whole lot of preconceived notions about what this was going to be like and really tried to wipe my mind clean of it. Mm. Um, but there are so many things that like, I just did this a lot in Kenya, in East Africa. Like, <laughs> and like, it's so like, that's really humbling to me that like, you can go like, I'm 33 or 34 years old. Um, I've been around the world, seen a lot of places, and I can still <laughs> go to somewhere and I'd be like, y'all do it that way. Interesting. Like, it just, it's been very helpful to see that there are people that, and cultures that still go their own way um, and find a way that works and like everything gets done. Like, maybe not the same like time schedule or in the same way that you expect it to, but things get done, and that's been really, really cool to see. I like that. Yeah. I like that a lot. <laughs> and it's so important because you can get locked into this. But that's not how we do it. That's not how I grew up yeah. doing it. And it robs you of the experience. Yes. Yeah. And also the connection. Mm -hmm. And then being in the present. Yes. I, I like how you said that. There's a lot of like acceptance. I think that generally to try, you get with travel of just like, okay, I'll do it this way. So that's fine. But I've never really been to a place quite like East Africa where like things are just done in, in its own particular way. It's no better. It's no worse. There's no judgment to be made about it. It's just, it's really interesting to see that like, I've never even considered doing this thing that way. And this is a country full of people who do it this way. Um, and it's really, it's humbling. Give you know? me an example. Now I'm curious. <laughs> oh, man. What am I thinking of? Okay. So, for example, um, we were talking about how, like, things can be delivered here. Anything you want in Nairobi, basically, you can order up a, a motorcycle to go get it for you. Um, and it's just really interesting to me that that's, like, the way that it, it, things are done. Like, like that delivery system because it's very convenient but it also like it's interesting because you'll be in your apartment and you'll get a text message or a whatsapp from the owner of a store that hey it's on its way and then the the rider calls your kenyan number and you pick up and then you go downstairs and like um i had somebody deliver a number of oh these shirts so i could try them on <laughs> and like 
she sent an like extra shirts for me to try on but the boat driver was like waiting for me and I was like should I run upstairs and he was like no you can just like we could just try them on right here and so like I'm standing outside on the street corner and like at like 11 p.m. at night trying on shirts in Parklands <laughs> sure why not you know yeah <laughs> Um, and it's just, and you know, I picked out what I liked and I sent the rest back and I don't know, there's just a certain level of way of thing, people doing things and maybe not as much direction as like I would be used to having of like the Boda driver will arrive at this time. He'll call you, you'll go outside, you'll try on shirts, he'll send you <laughs> what you want. So they just, they, it just happens, and then it's like, wait, what do I do now? And then somebody tells you what to do, and you're like, well, this is really different from how I would expect this interaction to go. Like, Amazon doesn't do that. <laughs> and Try as they might. Yeah, try as they might. They do not have that level of service. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, on that note, that concludes this conversation with this wonderful woman. I'm so happy we crossed paths. Me too. Yes, so thank you for joining us on this episode of Blacks into Africa. I hope that you were inspired, empowered, and entertained to Blacks it somewhere. <laughs> somewhere. Just go. It may not it may not be Africa, but we were talking earlier. It's my intention that we as black people self-actualize. So wherever you are able to self-actualize, Go there, do that, be that. And until next time.